Welcome to Military Images Live. I'm Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images, and welcoming you to season two, episode 11 of the program. While we allow for folks to come on to the streaming program, uh, I want to say a few words about our sponsor, the Excelsior Brigade, uh, bringing to you fine quality militaria for uh, a long, long time now. Uh, one of the things that Excelsior Brigade is known for is the quality of their identified images. In fact, if you go to their website, excelsiorbrigade.com, you will find numerous examples of uh, photographs for sale. So uh, with that, I want to uh, move into a couple of other events. While folks are coming on, I see Chuck Joyce is here, Doug York is here, Craig McNutt and others. Uh, while you all are coming on, I want to tell you about where you'll find military images over the next couple of weeks. Starting this Thursday morning, uh, military images will be at uh, West Virginia Day. It's the annual celebration. And uh, I will be in Morgantown talking about the history of photography, specifically around Civil War photography. So if you live in the Morgantown, West Virginia area, come by and say hello. Be part of the audience. Uh, also, from Morgantown, we'll be making our way to Ashtabula, Ohio, for Fighting for Freedom. This is our first traveling museum exhibit, and uh, we will be at the Hubbard House in Ashtabula, Ohio, featuring, featuring about 22 images of identified African-American soldiers who fought in the U.S. colored troops. So if you live in the greater Cleveland area, make your way down to Ashtabula on Saturday, June 22nd, and Sunday, June 23rd for the events. Go onto their Facebook page, look for Hubbard House. So, one more event to tell you about. This is the Gettysburg 45th Civil War artifact and collectible show. And as the name implies, it will be held in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. That's beginning on June 28th, uh, June 29th, and June 30th. Uh, we're going to have a special event called the Gettysburg Gathering on Friday, June 28th. The doors are going to open to the public about 6.30 on Friday night. And to all of you who can't be there, we'll be hosting this on Military Images Live. We'll have some great speakers, including Chuck Joyce. He'll be talking about images uh, from his collection of Gettysburg casualties. We'll have Kurt Luther talking about Civil War photos, sleuth. Gary McQuarrie from Civil War Navy Magazine talking about a Civil War photographer. And Rick Brown, one of Military Images senior editors. So join us either in Gettysburg or on Military Images Live for this great program. Now, on to the magazine. Uh, some of you may have seen the issue. Uh, it was mailed on Friday and uh, is making its way through the mails to all of you. This is the cover, which is a bit unusual for the magazine. You're gonna immediately recognize the unusual quality of his coat. Um, take a look at the very tall collar and take a look at the wheel hat. You can see the roundness of the hat right there and the visor in his hand. These are telltale signs of a Mexican War soldier. This image and about another 25 images, all rare Mexican War daguerreotypes from the Dr. William Schultz collection are featured in this image, uh, in this issue. So uh, if you don't have the issue, definitely uh, make your plans to get one. You can go to militaryimagesmagazine.com uh, and get a copy and read up on these amazing images. One of the uh, items of interest about uh, Bill Schultz's collection is how many of the images he has from the Mexican War period that are all identified. And several of these men made their way to the Civil War. 
We're going to tell you about their early lives and perhaps not a big surprise, the way that they performed uh, acts of courage and other acts that were not so courageous also became evident during the Civil War. So look for the next issue of Military Images. It's out, it's available now, and you will find this amazing collection of images from Bill Schultz. There's two more items I wanna to tease to you that you'll find in the magazine. One of them is related to those of you who watched this program a few months ago at least. Uh, we featured this image when we were talking about uh, memorial photographs. You may remember this is uh, an unusual name. His name is Admiral Kuhn, and he's holding a child. So uh, after showing this image on the program, we learned a lot more about his life and his tragic fate at Gettysburg. We also got to see a number of other images. One of them is the actual original tintype from which this portrait was made. And you can see he's holding the same child. It's the exact same pose. You'll also find out in the issue, and I'm teasing to it here for you, that if you remove the mat from the photograph, you're going to see the hint of a dress of a woman who is sitting beside him. You will also see the image of that woman sitting next to him. And you'll also see a close-up portrait of him. Now, I'm not going to give away the ending other than to mention his tragic fate as Gettysburg, but you're going to find out more about the woman, more about the child who he is posed with in the current issue. I have one more story to tease tonight for the issue. And that's this gentleman who's wearing an unusual um, battle shirt or a hunting shirt. Uh, it has several different names, but this one is quite interesting with all the decoration going on in there. Now, we know who he is. His name is Mims Walker, and he served in the 4th Alabama Infantry. He later on became an aide-de-camp to Brigadier General Evander Law. And if that wasn't interesting enough, I have to say that I think that maybe Mims Walker wanted his story to be told in this issue. Why do I say that? Because just a few days before the issue went to press, I received an image submitted completely out of the blue by collector Guy DeMossi. And here is another image of Mims Walker, completely unsolicited, completely out of the blue. And if you can see, it's definitely the same soldier, both ID'd. A close-up of Mims Walker's face gives you a sense of the quality of this photograph and the quality of photography from this period. I did mention that this is from the collection of Brian Boothy, but when you see it in the magazine, you're gonna be amazed at the pores of his skin uh, the quality of his visor, the detail of his shirt, it's all there. Truly amazing, a tribute to the photographers of that time period. Now, I wanna share this image with you. This is an image that we published last year. And uh, the caption was, I goes to fight mit Siegel. So it's one of the famous German phrases used by those many regiments from Wisconsin uh, that fought under General Franz Siegel in the Union Army. Uh, the story goes on to talk about the gentleman here who was Ferdinand Wallach, uh, a Prussian immigrant who came to America and served in the 26th Wisconsin Infantry. He made it all the way through the war, uh, down through Tennessee into Georgia, up through the Carolinas campaign. This image came to the attention of Margaret Barris. Uh, Margaret lives up in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area, and she became fascinated with one aspect of this image, which is the backdrop. On the backdrop, you can see here where it says 26 Siegel Regiment. 
that's unusual. There are a few images that have this backdrop, but what we don't know is the photographer. Now, Margaret has done some fantastic research, and here's her theory. She says, Camp Siegel is located on Milwaukee's east side. In checking the addresses of the photographers in 1862, which is when Ferdinand enlisted, uh, it appears that there were two photographers in the area. C.C. Montag on Division and Market Street, they were the closest. Another photographer, L. Meyer, was on River and Division Streets. So it's possible that one of these two photographers, either C.C. Montag or L. Meyer, took this image of Ferdinand Wallach. So we're looking for more information. Margaret is hard on the research trail, trying to track down this information, trying to find other images, also looking for letters uh, from enlistees who were at um, Camp Siegel who might have mentioned either Montag or Meyer. So if you have any leads about who this photographer might be, specifically Montag or Meyer, let us know, and we're going to connect you with Margaret Barris, who is doing an awesome research job. So Margaret, if you're listening, thank you. All right, next up. We have Lieutenant Thomas Moreland of the 2nd Kentucky Cavalry. He rode with General Forrest on those well-known raids, including the Ohio raid, where he was captured. We know a few things about this photograph. After Moreland was captured, he was ultimately taken to Fort Delaware, where he spent the rest of the war. On May 3rd, 1864, his photograph was taken. This photograph, the one right here, this was taken on May 3rd of 1864. This carte de visite of him was made probably at the very end of the war, maybe, I don't know, maybe sometime in 1865, possibly in 1866, and it was not printed at Fort Delaware. It was printed in New York on Broadway uh, by the New York Photographic Company. So what makes it interesting is that somehow this negative or a copy of it got to New York and was published there. What is even more interesting is this. When you take a close look and when you hold the image to the side, you can barely see the albumen. You can barely see the gloss of the print coming off of the image. In fact, it looks like someone has actually pressed the image down into the mount. In fact, the owner of this image, Malin Nichols of Virginia, he thought at first that the image was actually printed on the cardboard mount itself. And so he even cited some examples uh, from Dave Mark's amazing book on Maryland, uh, Confederate Marylanders during the Civil War. Uh, in fact, he wrote to Dave and Dave said, yeah, he said, I've got a bunch of these images, about five of them are featured in his book. So. I looked up Dave's book, which is right here, Maryland Confederate Faces. We took a look at those images. We talked to Dave Mark. We talked to Ross Kelbaugh, uh, trying to understand how did this photograph come to be made? Um, is it actually uh, some sort of process that was experimented on by printing directly on a cardboard mount? Or was it some other kind of technique? So here's what we found. The images that you'll find in Maryland Confederate faces, about five of them, uh, these images are actually printed and they cover the entire uh, mount, the carte de visite, the albumen print covers the entire mount. And that's unusual because those of you who are collectors of CDVs, you know that the albumen mount, is, or pardon, the albumen print is usually trimmed around the edges and the cardboard mount is exposed. Well, in these unique examples in Dave Mark's book, the Ben Dan brothers out of Baltimore, who were very, very, very well known as photographers, apparently experimented with a different technique where they laid the albumen print over the entire cardboard mount and then 
they cut the edges, they trim the edges right up to the edge of the cardboard mount. These are probably copy prints that were made from those original Fort Delaware photographs by the Bendan brothers in Baltimore. Now apparently this image that was taken in New York is slightly different and our current working theory is that the albumin print was somehow pressed into the cardboard sort of like um, an embossing but done in reverse and pushed into the cardboard. So I want to show you this back mark again. If you find any images that have this back mark, uh, the New York Photographic Company in Broadway, New York, we want to hear from you because we're looking for more examples of this specific type of photograph. The one where the image is literally pressed into the cardboard mounts. Now, one thing I should also add is the New York Photographic Company was active in the 1860s and the 1870s. You'll notice on this particular example, there's a union shield. And now those union shields uh, and other patriotic motifs, they begin to disappear after the war. Um, you've, you can look at these images yourself and you'll see numerous examples of eagles, of shields, Lady Liberty, um, those sorts of patriotic motifs. Well, they begin to disappear. So my theory is that this image probably dates from anywhere I'd say 1864 to maybe 1867. So be on the lookout for these images. If you find one, let me know. Thank you. We have more. This image comes in through our friend David Keller. Uh, there you go. Uh, David Keller is, uh, as some of you may know, is very active with Camp Douglas, the Chicago prisoner of war camp. This photograph uh, came to his attention. It is uh, was given um, or sent to him by Ann Tice, who uh, had a group of photographs. This one did not seem to be related to the rest of them. So at first, it's a bit of a head scratcher. What you've got here is some uh, seems light colored uniforms. These are clearly musicians. It may not be obvious to you, but you can see the pleated uh, style on both of these jackets, these short trim jackets, with our, which are very much uh, in line with musicians from the Civil War period. You're also going to see some waist belts, uh, waist buckles. A lot of this looks to be fairly standard issue stuff. The dark hats, uh, the drum, and it appears to be a hint of an eagle uh, on the back. Now, if we turn the photograph over, we're going to see the telltale sign down here at the bottom of D.F. Brandon. I also should mention that this gentleman here has an X over his head. And for those of you who collect, uh, you know that oftentimes that X means that on the back, the individual is going to be identified. In fact, he is, but the name is almost impossible to read. So I want to put this on the Facebook page here after the show so you can take a look and tell me if you can decipher it. Now, I became curious because D.F. Brandon is oftentimes associated with Confederate prisoner of war images. It appears that Brandon would go to the Camp Douglas and he would take photographs of the Confederate soldiers. And it's very likely that those images were then sent home to loved ones in the South as proof that they were still alive. I don't see that many Union images uh, taken by Brandon, but this one here certainly has that feel. Furthermore, I had a suspicion that they might be from the Veteran Reserve Corps uh, because of those light colored jackets that they're wearing. So I contacted my good friend, uh, Brett Schweinfurth, who some of you may have uh, seen on Facebook uh, talking about the VRC or the Veteran Reserve Corps or the Invalid Corps, depending upon how you want to talk about it. And uh, Brett was, of course, extremely helpful. Uh, he says um, uh, he has one Camp Douglas document that they account for two musician swords. So they had musicians there. In particular, those musicians were from, guess what, the 8th Veteran Reserve Corps. 
So the working theory is that these two musicians with the drums and the musician's sword carried by the one gentleman were members of the band of the 8th Veteran Reserve Corps. So I wouldn't say the mystery is solved, but we're on the way. So if you've got information about the 8th VRC, specifically images of these two guys taken by D.F. Brandon, let us know. Moving on. Not everybody is on Facebook. Uh, Bill Blankeny is a subscriber, a longtime subscriber to Military Images. And uh, Bill occasionally sends me photographs in the hopes that I can help him out, uh, identifying them or um, providing any clues that might lead to an identity. This one he sent to me, I found rather fascinating for a few reasons. Uh, he's a cavalryman. You can tell this, a Union cavalryman, you can tell his cap up here is just tilted high enough where you can't see the number or the company letter, but you can see the cross sabers, which tells us that he served in the cavalry. He also has uh, the short jacket, the trim, the pants, the pants are reinforced. Of course, the cavalry saber helps tell us who he is. So we've got a pretty good idea here that this is a federal cavalryman. Also of interest is he's standing in front of a pretty unique backdrop. I see some examples in the background of uh, maybe it looks like palm trees, something uh, vaguely tropical. There's some grasses down here. You've got um, a, a tube of a cannon. You've got a whole long row of tents going on. Uh, and it's kind of funny because you've got this sort of outdoor camp scene, and then you've got quite a beautiful carpet uh, with a design beneath it. Now, here's the part that really caught my attention. There's some writing right down there uh, next to this uh, cavalryman's calf. And if you flip it over, you're going to see, plain as day, uh, here's his leg, here's his, uh, his shoe, his boot, and it says Miller, and then you can see P-H-O-T-O. -O. So clearly, it said Miller Photographer. Now, I have to admit, I was a little stumped. Uh, I felt like I had seen this backdrop before, but I could not place it. So I actually put this on Facebook, I think it was last week, and um, within minutes, uh, Rick Brown, who among uh, other things, is gonna be a speaker at the Gettysburg Gathering, he's the senior editor of Military Images, he shot back with these two images, and guess what? It's the same floor, it's the same backdrop, the same camp scene, the same cannon tube, all that stuff, an, an exact match to Bill Blankney's image. Now, we also have their names down here, which is great. Uh, both of these men appear to be infantrymen, so they did not serve in the same cavalry regiment as uh, Bill Blankney's guy. But here's the great thing. If you turn this image over on the back, guess what you're gonna find? Ah, yes, the telltale back mark. And uh, on that back mark, it says, Union Photographic Gallery, Camp Butler, Newport News, VA. So guess what? We now know that this cavalryman was at Newport News, Virginia, sometime probably early in the war. Uh, and here's where it gets really good. There's not one but two names uh, on here. Uh, so here's the names of the two photographers who apparently paired up to go down to uh, Camp Butler in Newport News. Uh, the first one uh, is a Massachusetts photographer. His name is H.P. Ross of South Groton, Massachusetts. Now, here's the other guy, and remember the name of the photographer that's listed down here. Let me go back for you. Here we go, Miller photographer. The name on the other side, here we go, J. Sidney Miller of Nashua, New Hampshire. So there you go, Bill Blankney. We got a little closer to an ID here. We can now tell Bill that his cavalryman was taken in Newport News at Camp Butler by J. Sidney Miller of Nashua, New Hampshire, or maybe H.P. Ross of South Groton, Mass. So a uh, great bit of information. I've got two more bits for you tonight. 
Uh, one of them is uh, a call to action, and I hope you can help. Fourth Kentucky Mounted Infantry, a federal unit. Uh, we have a note here from Mark Carey who says, I have two ancestors who are with the 4th Kentucky, and I'm trying to research their uniforms. The only photographs that Mark can find are of officers. And, um, and I have to say, Mark, he knows. I checked. I went into the military images archives and found a couple of examples uh, from our 40 years of magazines uh, of uh, 4th Mountain Infantry of Kentucky. And guess what? Only officers. So we're looking for uh, enlisted men uh, or non-commissioned officers from the 4th Kentucky Mounted Infantry. Dig into your collections. If you can help, let us know. Now, I've got one more bit for you tonight. And uh, this comes from Paul Booker. Paul is a collector. Paul is a dealer. I visited uh, Paul couple weeks ago now and um, saw his collection. Uh, and I actually didn't go there with the intention of purchasing anything from my own collection, but I walked away with two items. During the course of the evening that we spent, uh, we were talking about his interest uh, in collecting and how long he's been doing it. And um, at the end of the evening, we concluded our business uh, with the purchase. And so he handed me this envelope. If you can see inside the envelope, he's done just a wonderful job. I don't know if you can see all this here, uh, of providing all kinds of detail about the two photographs I bought. He's got the provenance. He went into the National Archives and uh, got their pension records, military service records, all this great information. While he was telling me about all this, he said, I don't know why I do this. Uh, why do I go to the archives? Why do I gather all this information? Why do I do all this research? Uh, and then he answered his own question in a way. Uh, as he was talking about it, he said, man, he says, I just wanna make sure that when I sell these images and I pass them along, because I'm a caretaker, when I pass these images along, I wanna make sure that the person who buys the photograph knows who these men are knows who these folks are that serve and can appreciate their stories. So in a way, it really, I don't know, it summed up a lot of why I collect. Um, I'm looking for these stories. I'm looking to be, uh, to do my part, to tell and preserve these stories, realizing that I'm only a caretaker of these images. I suspect, and I know from talking to some of you that you feel the same way. So we have a kindred spirit in Paul uh, for those of you who are at Gettysburg in a couple of weeks, you'll get to meet him, uh, hang out. And um, until Gettysburg or Morgantown or Ashtabula, I hope to see you in one of those places. If not, I'll see you on the next episode of Military Images Live. And with that, have a great night.